Thanks very much. Um, it's very nice to be here. I haven't been to one of these for a couple of years at least. And of course, pre-COVID, we used to have these quite regularly. So it's very nice to be back. And of course, like many over here, I'm also desperately keen to catch up with people I haven't seen for a long time. So I'm as guilty as anyone for coming in back very slowly. So first up in the section, we have Brad Braxter. Um, Brad is a research officer in plants pathology um, in New South Wales at DPI. He's based at Wagga, so he's a local. And um, he's looking at resistance screening in cereal and pulse cultivar disease. So this session is all about thinking about the future, thinking forward to the tools we have available and the ones that are on the horizon and really sort of taking that next step. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing what Brad's going to tell us about that. Thank you. Uh, good morning and thank you for the, for the introduction. Uh, this morning, I'm going to talk about, uh, I guess, the IDM strategies that we can implement uh, for key nectotrophic diseases in southern New South Wales. This morning, Freehan gave us a great status update, but now we're going to talk about how we uh, implement things to stop that resistance. So, long-winded title, what are we actually looking at? So today we're going to discuss disease and fungicide resistance issues, the what, the why, and how we go about reaching for that drum last. So firstly, the what. There are some factors that we can control, there's others that we can't. Firstly, I think most people in here would recognise probably the 2D version of this, being the good old disease triangle. Three points, but here we have a fourth point and we'll discuss that in a second. Firstly, the first thing we cannot control when it comes to disease, the environment. The weather conditions dictate the initiation of disease epidemics and drive them throughout the season. So that is a big factor in the development of disease through a cropping year. Secondly, the pathogen, the pathogen itself, and more importantly, the diversity within that, uh, that pathogen, the genetic diversity, uh, increases the likelihood of resistance to fungicides. Sec uh, thirdly, and fourthly, other things such as green leaf area, uh, big bulky crops can drive uh, humidity, uh, leaf wetness, drive disease. The result of those big crops is big residual stubbles and the stubble that can harbour those uh, stubble-borne diseases over summer. And you'll notice that I've got two arrows going in there. Uh, of the six uh, points that I've just put up, um, up here, some of them don't fit neatly into one spot. And the uh, decisions or the levers we pull can influence these. Poor crop rotation. Putting a susceptible host, being the preceding wheat crop, into an environment that is hostile. So proper rotation, break crops, break down the stubble, reduce the pathogen load, will give a susceptible host, or in, in this case, the wheat crop, the best chance of getting away. And lastly, the fourth point of this 3D disease triangle is the management decisions we make. This is the thing that we can control the most out of all of this. So these factors all combine uh, with ideal climatic conditions all lead to promote high disease levels. Naturally, what do we do when we have high disease levels? We increase our fungicide use. So things such as repeated use of modes of action, uh, using the same actives, uh, high rates, low rates, all lead to on and off target disease, which can lead to resistance or the development of the resistance. So they're the issues. Now, the main culprits in southern New South Wales. These two pictures here, I don't think anyone uh, would be too surprised to see them. They're Septoria triticide blotch and yellow leaf spot. They often coexist in the same paddocks on the same varieties. They can be quite difficult to tell apart at some point um, because they often exist, and we've even seen them exist in the same lesion. So the defining diagnostic characteristic of Septoria triticide blotch is the black pycnidia structures in the lesion, as opposed to yellow leaf spot, which do not have these. So the black pycnidia within the septoria lesion can often be mistaken for teleospores, 
uh, which is the resultant structures of senescent stripe rust. It can also be, um, you know, uh, hard to tell apart from alternaria, uh, which colonise dead or dying tissue. So pretty much, um, you know, they, they're both nectotrophic diseases. They have very similar dispersal mechanisms. They both have a primary and a secondary um, infection source, uh, very different latency periods, um, and they have, um, you know, different resistance risks. So here, what, again, just backing it up with some of our survey data and our diagnostic data. So New South Wales DPI, we run a free diagnostic service for growers and agronomists. So Septoria and Yoa Lee Spot for 2021 were the third, equal third most queried diseases. And our paddock survey data shows that, and just disclaimer, that should read 2021 paddocks, not wheat paddocks. We surveyed 302 paddocks, and you can see the proportion of DNA that um, is present throughout New South Wales. So they're widespread and they coexist often in the same paddocks. So the why. Why do we need to worry about disease and the development of resistance? The genetic diversity within pathogen populations increases the likelihood of changes that may lead to resistance. By repeatedly spraying the same modes of action or the same actives will select for the resistant population. It will control the non-resistant populations and promote the build-up of resistant populations within our environment. This leads to reduced efficacy of fungicides or lost mode of action and the economic impact such as yield loss and ineffective spray um, applications. And as Fran pointed out, we have limited mo modes of action, so we need to look after the ones that we have. The how. How can we reduce the likelihood of developing resistance to septoria and yellow leaf spot? So we're going to discuss these in turn. Crop rotation, varietal selection, time of sowing, stubble management, and a, a part of an integrated disease management package, fungicides still are important, but it's the way we use them. Crop rotation, why is this important? In southern New South Wales, we have very tight wheat or cereal canola rotations. So excuse the fact that this is a, a crown rot graph, but it displays a very good point. So here highlighted is the canola and wheat. So this is a graph that displays out of southern New South Wales between 2014 and 2017, the preceding crop before a cereal is sown. So you can see that probably 90% or 90 of the data points sit either in a wheat or a canola as the previous crop before a cereal goes in. So we have very tight cereal wheat um, or uh, canola rotations. Uh, our 2021 paddock survey 102 of the 234 paddocks that were surveyed had a cereal prior to a wheat going in. So we are putting a susceptible host into an environment that is going to be conducive for disease. So what do diverse rotations give us? What do they do? What they do is it reduces the environment that a susceptible host goes into. It gives the chance to break down the inoculum prior to going back into a susceptible host. This in turn limits yield loss, reduces our reliance and puts uh, less pressure on our fungicide. So, uh, and, and further that, this is a presentation within itself, it has bigger rotational um, advantages. So now to some of the more detailed stuff here. So here, what we have, and I'm sorry, I was banking on a pointer here, so we might have to use our imaginations a little bit. Um, we have uh, a set of trials, so this is four years worth of data, four times of sowing, being middle of April, end of April, middle of May, end of May. So time of sowing is one to four. We have 30 varieties with different resistance ratings to STB. So these were assessed every two weeks for a percentage, so whole plant infection levels um, scored as a percentage. 
So what we can see, there's a few things that I'd like to point out. Firstly, variety choice can reduce in-crop septoria infection. So that top line there is an SVF. So if we're looking at timer sowing one here, that very top line that's at about 92% is an SVS variety. If we have a look at that bottom solid line, that is an MR variety. That is a difference of 70% infection. So picking a more uh, resistant variety can, can reduce the in-crop infection levels. And from there, we can actually see that that red box is a projected yield loss. So what we've got there is that SVS variety that has 92% is probably going to lose somewhere in between 30 to 40% yield loss. So it's quite significant. By coming back down to that bottom line in that top red box in time of sowing one, which is an MS variety, you're probably coming back down somewhere around 15 to 20% yield loss. So what you can do by picking more resistant variety is actually reduce the infection levels and reduce your yield loss. The time of sowing effect is also uh, quite stark. So we can see that again, the top line in time of sowing one is around 90% infection level. And when we go down to the time of sowing four, that top line again is an SVS variety, but it is back down around 50%. So it, by manipulating the time of sowing, we can actually reduce the infection levels within a susceptible variety. But we still need to sow that variety within its window to maximise yield. So if you can manipulate or move that variety later into its sowing window, you can actually influence the infection levels. So we're going, now going to discuss two um, stubble experiments. Firstly, ASCO spore release off stubble by resistance rating. And then secondly, uh, a harvest cut height trial. Firstly, stubble management. So what we have here, again, is four times of sowing. 30 varieties, again, assessed every two weeks for the total percentage infection. But the stubble was retained in the paddock, left to mature over summer, and then was collected. What we did then is we took five tillers and we put it through what we affectionately called the spore liberator. It used uh, humidity and suction to remove the spores from the, the stubble and onto a microscope slide where they were counted. This has a high degree of replication. So each of these um, you know, different ratings was uh, done over four years, 96 times, so 24 reps a year. So what we can see here, the nuts and bolts of it is, more spores were released than yellow leaf, uh, the STB spores were released than yellow leaf spot. But the bigger picture here is that an SVS variety, let's have a look at Septoria up the top, statistically, releases the same amount of ASCO spores off the stubble as an MR variety. There is also no difference statistically between sowing times and across sowing times for an individual variety. So what this does have um, a big, big disclaimer here. There is a big distinction that I, we need to make between selecting a variety for in-crop infection reduction and the resultant senescent stubble of that variety. So in crop has a big, um, a big help to reduce that infection, but say an MR variety in the live plant stage does not result in that stubble being an MR variety or uh, a lesser inoculum risk for the proceeding wheat crop. So there is a very big distinction that we have to make there. Stubble management trial number two. There was uh, three cut heights, single variety, Beckham, high, medium, and low, where we tried to reduce the cut height by one node as we went down. What we can see, again off just five tillers, 
uh, we saw a reduction in the number of ASCO spores released off that stubble. From a high cut height, 32 centimetres down to 24 centimetres, we saw an 87% reduction in the number of ASCO spores that come off that stubble. We further take that from a high to a low cut height, that's a 97% reduction in the number of ASCO spores that came off that stubble when we put it through the spore liberator. Now you're probably sitting there going, he's talking about ASCO spore this, ASCO spore that. What does it mean for me? What can I walk out of here knowing and implementing for my grower? Firstly, it's the acknowledgement of the risk that any infected stubble has the ability to initiate an epidemic. So we, in that, in that spore experiment, we were using just five tillers and getting anywhere from 100 to 300 spores, 100 yellow leaf spot spores up to 300 septoria spores off. You multiply that out over a square metre, a hectare, a paddock, we're talking about enormous spore loads. So the acknowledgement that any infected stubble can cause an epidemic. And as discussed previously, that the resistance rating of the senescent stubble does not decrease or increase the risk of inoculum coming off that stubble for the proceeding crop. But again, the distinction has to be made that in crop, it does make a difference. It's also the duration of risk. So it can be for at least two years, minimum of two years that stubble can release spores to initiate an epidemic. Coming back to our tight rotations, one break crop is probably not enough to reduce your risk of yellow leaf spot or septoria infection event. Now, stubble management is a key thing that we can use to reduce the number of ASCO spores released in our paddocks by reducing the harvest cut height. But there is a caveat to this. The caveat is, is that you can't relocate the stubble, standing stubble, chop it off lower and lay it on the ground. You're not re re, um, reducing or getting a net reduction in the number of ASCO spores, you're relocating it. So it has to be removed from that system. So this is where we have to either implement, say in a fully retained system, fully retained stubble system, bailing is an option and removal or narrow windrow burning or blanket burning. Whatever method that is practical and suits your growers, um, I guess, system or capabilities, but the risks have to be weighed up for each of those different options. Now, fungicides. Fungicides are an important tool, but it's the way we use them. And they are very effective at um, reducing yield loss. So this is a set of trials conducted 2020, 2021. We have a dry land and we have an irrigated treatment. So we have a fungicide, nil fungicide. So just a, the, the irrigated treatment was not an actual irrigation. It was supplementary to drive that humidity and leaf wetness to replicate probably a higher rainfall zone than a dry land system that we see in Wagga. So the, the nuts and bolts of it is, is that under a fungicide management program, as opposed to a nil treatment, you can protect between 19 and pretty much 50% of your yield. So they are effective. But there are nuances between, uh, I guess, uh, actives. So typically, tepiconazole and propiconazole in a curative fashion are less effective than, say, something like an epoxyconazole. Strobilurins are a protectant. So what we have to work, uh, remember is that we need to rotate our modes of action, only use an STHI or a strobilurin once a year, rotate our triazoles and use mixtures where possible. Always adhere to label rates. And this is an issue that I think, um, particularly because of the conducive season that we've had, MRLs for late applications. These are the things that we have to keep in the back of our mind. And um, as Fran pointed out, there is strobilurin resistance detected in South Australia, it's localised. 
So for New South Wales, we are still saying that strobilurins are effective against septoria. But if you suspect something go wrong, please seek help. Now the take home messages. Environment plays a huge role in disease development. That's unavoidable. And each year is going to be different, influenced by these climatic conditions. But the decisions we make influence the resistance development. Crop rotation, varietal selection, and time of sowing can reduce the in-crop infection levels. STB and yellow leaf spot can produce ascospores off stubble for up to two years, regardless of their resistance rating. Reduced harvest cut height can limit STB colonisation of the stubble, but that harvested material must not be left in the paddock. It must be removed to, re to reduce uh, the inoculum load. Fungicides are important to protect yield, but we must use them wisely. Implement an IDM. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge and thank the Crop Protection Forum for the invite to speak, uh, DPI and GRDC for co-funding under those two codes. Uh, project leads, Andrew Milgate and Steve Sinfordorf are under those codes. Andrew, um, for the use of the STB and YLS data, I actually didn't work on this project. I'm just fortunate enough to be able to present it to you guys. And lastly, the growers and agronomists who facilitate and support our research and fac facilitate access to paddocks. Thank you.